Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, Data for the Non-Data Librarian, with data librarians Jen Dara and Haley Mooney. My name is Andrew Mooney, and I am a Senior Acquisitions Editor at SAGE. I will start in by introducing you to our presenters for the day. Jen Dara is the Data Services and Sociology Librarian at Johns Hopkins University. She has been in the data services field for 15 years and has extensive knowledge about social science data resources, reference services, and instruction. Jen is an active member of the professional community as a member at large for the International Association for Social Science Information Services and Technology, past chair of the ACRL Anthropology and Sociology section, and the founding member of the ACRL Generic and Geospatial Data Services and Academic Libraries Interest Group. Haley Mooney is Data Services Coordinator and Social Sciences Librarian at the Michigan State University Libraries. She is the liaison to problems in human development and family studies, social work, and sociology. Haley works to develop and provide data management services at the MSU Libraries and is also the Social Sciences Data Librarian. Her current research interests are in the area of data information literacy, and changing scholarly communication norms. So now on to a few housekeeping items before I turn it over to our presenters. This one hour webinar will be recorded and archived for future viewing. We will be sending out a link to view it and to access the slides to all registrants in the coming weeks. If you have any problems with audio or viewing mode during the webinar, please use the Q&A box at the right of your screen and one of our team members will get back to you as soon as possible. At the end of the webinar, we will have some time for Q&A from attendees, so please also use the Q&A box to ask any questions to speakers throughout the webinar. Please also take note of the webinar hashtag SageTalks, and feel free to ask questions or leave comments here. And without further ado, I'll pass it over to Haley and Jen. Thank you. This is Haley. I'm going to get us started today. Oh, let's go back to our agenda, please. Back one slide. Yeah, so our agenda today, we're going to first start out with um, really looking at what is the difference between data and statistics. Then I'm going to take you through uh, my search strategies um, to make sure that you can find what you're looking for. Then Jen's going to talk to you about a frequent data FAQ, uh, which is local area resources. And then we're going to end with a chance to practice uh, with a reference question. So the first thing I want to address here is the difference between data and statistics. Because in normal conversation, we use these terms interchangeably. But the difference is really very important for us when we're answering reference questions. So on this slide, I have for you a statistic as well as one of our obligatory librarian cat slides. We've taken that care of right off the bat. So our statistic here is a factor figure, which gives us an observation which we can easily interpret. If we wanted the data, that would be the raw material behind the statistic. So if we had a list of all, every single librarian that was asked this question and their individual responses regarding their propensity to underreport cat ownership, that would be the data, those individual responses. Uh, let's go forward one slide. So here's another example where we can see how a survey question becomes either data or statistics. So that on the top of the slide, uh, we see part of a data collection mechanism, which is the survey question. Now underneath it, you can see a spreadsheet of values. So this is the data with every individual response to a survey question. And in fact, this is a snippet of an SPSS file, which is a statistical analysis program. So data are those raw research outputs which require some sort of analysis in order to comprehend. So sometimes you'll hear them referred to as machine readable data or micro data. On the right hand side of the slide, um, we're looking at statistics. So we have a table and a research article that are reporting those facts and figures. Statistics um, are providing uh, an interpretation or summary of the data. So this is a human readable, and we're seeing tables, charts, graphs, or percentages. 
Now, sometimes we have lots of individual responses that are combined together to provide summaries about something, like a geographic area. And so this would be a type of statistics called aggregate data, uh, such as demographic statistics from the census for all of the block groups in a city. And that's also where you'll hear the phrase statistical data sets applied as well. So I would like to turn things over to Jen now. She's shared some examples of reference questions she's actually received to give you the opportunity to try your hand at discriminating between data and statistics. Okay, hello everyone. So based on what Haley has given you uh, to work with on what the difference is between raw data sources and aggregate statistics sources, I have a couple questions for you from our own examples that Haley and I have both received in questions over the years. And you can take a crack at deciding, is this question, are they looking for data, or are they looking for statistics? Uh, there's three questions, and you'll have about 30 seconds to respond to the poll. The text is not going to be with the poll, so you're going to need to listen very carefully. I will repeat the question twice, and then you can provide the answer when the poll is up on your screen. So the very first question is, I am trying to locate data and statistics on new vehicle sales uh, over the past 10 years. If it was broken down by month, that would be even better. I want to see how sales prices have varied. So the poll question is, is this data or statistics? And I'll read that through one more time for you. I am trying to locate data on new vehicle sale prices over the past 10 years. If it was broken down by month, that would be even better. I want to see how sales prices have varied over time. Is this data or statistics? A few more seconds. Okay, let's close the poll and see what we've got. Okay, we look to be pretty evenly split here. So this question actually can likely be answered by statistical information. The reason being is that the patron is not looking to conduct any sort of complicated analysis, so having a full table of raw information is probably overkill. So a table, a chart, or a graph would likely be useful. I found the answer to this question uh, from the National Automobile, Automobile Dealers Association in their annual financial profile of America's franchise new car dealerships. Uh, they produce these reports annually, and it's actually freely available. Now, what's interesting is when I first answered this question a while ago, they had the archive reports on there, but they didn't anymore. So this would be one of those things you'd have to follow up with the source to find out where that past information went. But good job, folks. We can go to the second one. So our second question is, are you ready? Okay. I'm determining the feasibility of developing a senior apartment slash housing community in Easton, Maryland. I would really like to find information that breaks down household income by age for either Eastern Maryland or Talbot County, Maryland. So is this data or statistics? And I'll read it one more time. I'm determining the feasibility of developing a senior apartment slash housing community in Easton, Maryland. I would really like to find information that breaks down household income by age for either Easton, Maryland or Talbot County, Maryland. Is this data or statistics? I'll give you a couple more seconds. Okay, we can close the poll. Okay, still pretty split, but more this time on statistics. And those who answered statistics are correct. Um, this person wanted a particular piece of information, so income by age or location. It's a specific and finite piece of information, and these kinds of things can usually be answered with statistics as long as it's one that's been collected. There will be the rare occasion where the data just doesn't seem to exist in a readily available statistic, but more often than not, something like this actually has been. I obtained this information from the American Community Survey, which I'm going to talk more about in detail later. 
So we can move on to our third and final question. I want to find out how many people with alcohol dependency also have been diagnosed with a psychiatric disorder. I want to determine the most common disorders and investigate the relationship between amount of alcohol imbibed and severity and length of systems, or symptoms. Huh? So poll question, is this data or statistics? And don't worry, it's a long one, so I'll read it again. I want to find out how many people with alcohol dependency also have been diagnosed with a psychiatric disorder. I want to determine the most common disorders and investigate the relationship between amount of alcohol imbibed and severity and length of symptoms. So is this data or statistics? And we'll give you a few more seconds. Okay, we can close the poll. All right, so this one seemed a little bit more clear that people thought that you would need to be finding actual data, and that's correct. Since the patron is interested in looking at multiple factors, statistical information is probably not going to be enough. Haley is going to talk more about the reference interview next. The reference interview, just like it is for uh, literature reference questions, is an important tool in figuring out just what type of data the patron really wants. It can be as simple as asking, do you need the data to run your own analyses? Or are you looking to see if someone else has done analysis of this type and has written on it? And you can look at some charts and graphs. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Haley. Okay, thanks, Jen. Yeah, so uh, a couple of those questions were a little bit tough to answer. We all know that uh, the first question that the patron gives us, we often want to follow up on, right? That's the point of the reference interview. And like Jen said, that's going to really help you decide whether or not the person wants statistics or data. So really work to clarify the person's uh, purpose or intent. Uh, if they want to do initial uh, additional analysis, that's a really good giveaway that they really do need that micro data. Another thing to consider is the person's time and ability. Um, they need to have the time and ability to work with a statistical software program if they are going to be using data. So the next things that you need to figure out are kind of, this is the five W's here. The first is the why, then you're going to the who or the what. Well, what's the unit that they're studying? What's the topic? And this can be a few different things. Um, it can be people. Uh, such as individuals or households. It could be organizations. They could be looking at something like companies or nation states. Or it could also be commodities or things. A person might be looking at uh, crops. They might be looking at arrests even. That could be their unit of analysis would be crime arrests. The next thing that you're looking at is when. Well, what is the point in time that they're looking for? Are they looking for a point in time or a time series? You want to be sure that you uh, know what they're hoping to find. So one thing to keep in mind is that uh, current statistics or data will always have a lag just because of the time that it takes to collect information and uh, publish it. And historical availability can be tricky sometimes too. That's going to always depend on when data collection began for a particular thing. The next thing to suss out is where. Um, so what uh, geographic area is the person looking for? There are two main types of geographic classifications that statistics and data tend to fall into. The first would be political boundaries. So a nation, a state, a county, or even a school district would count as a political boundary. The next that you'll often find are statistical or census geographies, um, such as the uh, metropolitan statistical area, a census tract or a census block group. And you'll often find that uh, the smaller area a person uh, is looking for, sometimes the harder it can be to find. So I just here mentioned uh, a couple caveats related to time and space. So expectation management is one thing that I really do like to communicate uh, to students on the hunt for data and stats. Uh, you can see some examples here on the side of some very specific types of requests where I was actually not able to provide an answer. 
Uh, especially for very special types of populations and sensitive information, it's actually quite possible that the data does not exist or isn't readily available. Someone always has to be interested enough, has the resources to collect and publish the data, and this hasn't always happened. Uh, or it could be that the data is available, but it's behind an expensive paywall, or uh, it's in a, only in a format that's really difficult to use. So depending on individual resources, access and use sometimes may not be possible. You want to express to students, express to your patrons that they need to be flexible and see if there is wiggle room in their date, geographic coverage, or exact variable. So I like to get that up front so that I can go back and search or search with them and see if there is that wiggle room. So I want to talk about my search strategies now. And uh, many data and stats questions can be tricky to answer and do require involved searches. That's why we're all at this uh, webinar today. So I want to share with you my five-pronged search strategy. And this is what I use to ensure that I have covered all of my bases before uh, declaring to a student or a faculty member that the, the, that the data they're looking for are not available. This allows me to be really confident in the answers that I give. Now, I have published my search strategies in the LibGuide address that you see posted at the bottom of this slide, and I do receive requests from time to time to reuse my LibGuide with attribution, and you're certainly welcome to do so uh, if you'd like. So I'm going to go into the statistics search strategies first. And the very first search strategy for statistics uh, is to use a finding aid. So we can advance one slide, please. So there are lots of great libguides or research guides out there on uh, stats and data for various topics that you can use as a starting point. Um, in fact, when I first started working as a data librarian, I used the exercise of creating libguides to help me learn the major, major statistical publishers uh, in various subject areas. Now, reference sources, as you know, just like for anything, are another great finding aid. So statistical abstracts are basically the encyclopedias of the, stat of the stats world. So even if they don't have the exact uh, table, the exact thing that you need, they can still be very useful because you can treat their footnotes like bibliographies and follow references as needed. My two favorite are the Stat App of the United States and Historical Statistics of the United States, which has really fabulous explanatory essays. If you've never looked at those essays before, they're so worthwhile. If they don't have the table you need, you can usually find some information in that essay um, to help you dig uh, back to the primary source that you need. So it's very helpful uh, for understanding when different statistical programs started. So with statistical databases, um, a statistical database is generally what I would call like a full text database, and then it's going to contain statistics pulled from many different sources and repackage them together in one convenient interface. So these databases will uh, sometimes contain exactly what you need, providing you directly with a table, graph, or map. Uh, the one on here that uh, can be a little bit different is ProQuest Statistical Insight, and that's because it's actually an index to the statistical literature, not a dynamic database. So it may or may not have the full text. Those of you that are old school might remember uh, the original American Statistical Index, the Statistical Reference Index, and the International Index to Statistics, and that's what it's based on. And some of your libraries may, in fact, have the microfiche collection uh, with all of the full text. Uh, indexing is mainly at the publication level, although they are starting to uh, index at the table level as well. So that kind of, uh, you're coming in at a different level there. And it can be particularly useful uh, for private sector sources, uh, which are not otherwise open access. So the second search strategy uh, is to identify potential producers. You want to ask yourself, who might collect or publish this type of information and go to their website or search for their publications. Now this of course takes some time and experience to be able uh, to, to use, uh, but you might have some familiarity with different producers already. So the four main types of producers um, are listed here. 
Uh, government agencies, the U.S. government is a major producer of data and statistics. In fact, there are 13 different uh, big statistical agencies and actually over 90 agencies that have different smaller statistical programs. The U.S., we don't have a centralized statistical agency, and this is different if, you're, if you get an international question. Some other countries uh, do actually have a central statistical agency, uh, but we have a very dispersed and decentralized system. Uh, the second uh, main producer type is non-government organizations. So this would be non-commercial, non-profit uh, organizations that collect statistics to support their social platforms. And many are now making their uh, open data available on the web. Some good examples are the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, United Nations, and the World Health Organizations. Uh, next, we have academic institutions, and uh, uh, colleges or universities may sponsor different research projects or have ongoing surveys which advance knowledge about some particular area of importance to that institution. One example here at MSC was the Afrobarometer, which is a public pin opinion poll of African nations. In the private sector, uh, there are lots of commercial firms that will collect and sell data for a profit. Uh, good examples are marketing uh, firms, pollsters, trade organizations, or business information. And of course, this will cost money, uh, so access will depend on your uh, resources or the resources of your patron. And one good example is the Gallup polls. So my next search strategy for statistics is to turn to the literature. Uh, so what has been published? Uh, if they report a source, do your best to follow up on it. This is really good. This example here uh, of the CQ researcher is great for like an undergraduate student who's researching popular topics. Um, you can steer them towards a new source, a new source uh, like the one here from CQ researcher, which usually does guarantee usable references. Uh, for harder to answer questions, the scholarly literature may report on very niche type of statistics. Uh, the methodology section could provide a clue as to whether or not they come from a publicly available source. My next search strategy, targeted online searches. Uh, this is basically a sophisticated version of Google it, right? Um, so when you're on the general web, I love the domain limiter for site.gov. Um, this can be really useful since so many statistics do originate from government agencies. Um, and then of course, you know, something basic like adding data or statistics uh, to your topic keywords as well. Um, if you have a large collection, your library catalog can be useful too. Um, those uh, Library of Congress subject headings can help clue you into different statistical series. And then with statistical indexes, you can easily loop back there to strategy number one. Uh, so my fifth search strategy for statistics is to ask for help. Um, knowing when to call in reinforcements is important, as I uh, have listed here. So reach out to another colleague uh, at your library, another relevant subject expert, or your listserv community. If you've been able to identify a potential producer, such as a government agency, get in touch with them, pick up the phone. Um, down here at the bottom, it's kind of hard to read, but there's uh, the contact information for the Waterborne Commerce Statistics Center. These are folks that I picked up the phone and called because I couldn't make heads or tails of uh, what was going on, but I was pretty sure they were the, the producer and they were really helpful. Um, staff at government agencies can indeed be quite helpful, and sometimes that phone call actually is uh, a better way to go than email to get in touch with somebody um, and uh, clarify with them what you're looking for. So I want to go to data now um, because uh, the search strategies are similar, but there's a little bit of, of difference. There's some slight variations here. So for search strategy number one, uh, it's to search in a data archive. So a data archive or a data repository are the main uh, publication outfits for data. If you're an academic subject librarian, uh, you may want to take some time to become familiar with the major data archives used by researchers in your area. Uh, for social sciences, ICPSR, Inter-University Consortium for Political and Social Research, is the major data archive. Uh, they've got lots of survey data and are a great place to find and access uh, relevant data sets for researchers. 
r3data.org, that stands for Registry of Research Data Repositories. Um, it was formerly known as DataBib, uh, but now it's r3data.org. Um, and it can be used to identify data repositories across all subject areas. Uh, the final one I'll mention for helping to identify data archives is the Data Citation Index. This is a new component of Web of Science, and uh, it is indeed an index to repositories and data sets. So it's not a data archive itself, uh, but it does allow you to search across the contents of many different ones. Uh, search strategy number two for data is the same as for statistics, which is to identify and investigate the websites and publications of potential producers. Some agencies will indeed publish not just the statistics, but the data underlying them as well. Uh, search strategy number three I'm going to go on to now. It's to, again, uh, look at the regular literature. Now, in the case of data, this is usually the research literature rather than the popular literature. So searching in a subject index for an article that is on topic and paying particular attention to the methodology section is what you want to do. You want to see if you can identify where the data comes from and ideally find a citation for that data based on secondary analysis of a publicly available data set. Now this is indeed ideal because data are in fact not always properly cited. Most of the time they aren't. Uh, even when it's a publicly available data set. But if the data has the proper name, such as survey of such and such, um, in the methodology section, that's a good clue that it might be open data and you can search on the name of that uh, study. Otherwise, the data behind most small research studies are not published and made openly available. Uh, some data archives, such as ICPSR, track usage of their data within the literature, so you can actually search right within their bibliography for a topical article and then use that to track back to the data. Uh, now that Web of Science has integration with Data Citation Index, they've got links to between articles and data sets. Books on research methods can be really great, too, to profile major public data sets used within a field of study. A couple examples are provided here, one for psychologists and one on archival research methods as the unobtrusive measures. So if you search for the keyword phrase secondary analysis, uh, you can use that to find a similar title in your subject area. And search strategy number four is that statistics lead to data. So if you can ID a statistical table that contains a key variable you're looking for, you may then be able to use the source notes to track down to the underlying data. So in this example here on smoking behavior, you can see in the footnote uh, that it's directing you to the National Health Interview Survey, which you can then investigate for suitability and for public access options. Search strategy number five, again, asking for help. This is the final search strategy for data, just like statistics. Get in touch with other subject experts if you need to. If you're lucky enough to be at an institution with a data librarian, or if you're a new data librarian yourself, you may know or be someone with a membership in iAssist organization, which is the International Association for Social Science Information Service and Technology. And this organization has a wonderful listserv with an amazing bunch of experienced and helpful data librarians. And just like for statistics, contact, uh, contacting potential providers is also highly recommended. So that's it. Those are my search strategies. If you follow all of these uh, strategies, you can be really confident in the answer that you give uh, to your patron. So what I'd like to do now is turn things back over to Jen, who's going to give us a primer on common, a common data and stats FAQ. Okay, everybody. So let's talk a little bit about local resources. Social science faculty sometimes want students to find statistics and data about the city, county, or state in which the college or university that they attend is located. This could include looking at the crime rate, healthy food options, transportation options, education, poverty, health issues, and relationships between some of those things. So where would you direct a student to find this kind of information? The first would be the American Community Survey, or ACS, as it is commonly referred to, 
and I'll talk a little bit more about that in detail shortly. Others would include local government sources, local nonprofits and other organizations, and local colleges and universities also have research groups studying particular issues as well, often in the area in which the, the school itself is located. So you'll notice this is kind of similar to what Haley was talking to in her search strategies at a higher level. Of course, larger cities have more sources than smaller suburbs or rural areas, but some state-based organizations or even larger universities can have data on smaller and more rural areas in the state. So let's talk a little bit about the American Community Survey. If you recall answering the 2010 census, you'll remember that it was actually really short. It was only 10 simple, fairly non-invasive questions. Those who had worked with data from the 2000 census wondered, well, where did all that information go about income and education, language spoken at home, travel to work? This information was collected in what was called the long form in previous years of the census. The long form was received by about one in five households, so the long form data was sample data as opposed to the full census itself. It was presented in what was called summary files, and this information is what many demographers studying the United States population would turn to when they needed data. So where did it go? Enter the American Community Survey. Planning for the ACS began as early as 1990, where the idea of continued measurement of the population as opposed to a snapshot once every 10 years was first proposed. The questions were very similar, but not exactly the same as the long form, and would go to a smaller sample of the population. The idea of the ACS is that of rolling estimates. They would collect data every year and publish the results at different intervals. So instead of waiting for 10 years for data to come up on the U.S. population, researchers, policymakers, local governments, and the like would all have data on the U.S. population every single year. So that's pretty amazing. The first full implementation of, uh, for the United States and Puerto Rico was actually in 2005. So what about using the American Community Survey? The idea was to release the data in a one, three, and a five-year set of files. The one-year data is the most current, and it is published for areas with a 65,000 plus population. There is more sampling error in this file than there is in the others because it is only one year of data from a fairly small sample of the population. The actual number can shift, but we can say between one and, well, it's one in 40 households thereabouts. So yeah, it's pretty small. Only about 3% of the population receives this survey at one time. The three year data, which unfortunately has just been discontinued, offered a larger set of data, which leads to less error, for areas with 20,000 or more in the population. The five-year, which is considered the most reliable due to its having the largest amount of data, narrows that sample error gap, um, offers data for all levels of geography, all the way down to census block group. It is a favorite of people who are doing geospatial analysis, just because they can do lots of cool things with mapping. The most current data from the ACS available now are the 2013 one-year, the final three year for 2011 to 2013, and the five year for 2009 to 2013. Remember what Haley said about uh, some of that lag. It takes a long time to clean up that data. Let's move ahead on to city, county, and state governments. So your local government uses and collects a lot of data. In theory and practice, this data should be open for the public to access. The open data movement initiated by the Office of the President had a tremendous ripple effect. Many larger cities and counties have followed the example of the U.S. government with their open data portal, data.gov, to open up access to their own data. I've included a link here that will take you to the official open data portals list. So that's the one there at the bottom. 40 out of the 50 states actually have open data portals. That's pretty impressive. And 46 U.S. cities and counties also have open portals. So some of the cities on this list include Washington, D.C., Burlington, Vermont, Albuquerque, New Mexico, and New Orleans, Louisiana. Even if your city or area is not on either of these lists, it doesn't mean that data is not available or open for you to access. Maybe raw data isn't available, but aggregate statistical information is. If aggregate statistical information is available, you can often find out the source, as Haley said, staff lead to data and dig deeper. So we go on to the next slide. So local government agencies, those with a .gov and sometimes a .org domain, often provide data or publish statistics. Some of these agencies are health departments, education departments, school districts, local housing agencies, local transportation agencies, and your police department and other public safety agencies. Explore your local government's list of agencies and see what you might be able to find. Look for pages on those sites that either say data, statistics, research, projects, or reports. 
And as Haley mentioned earlier, never be afraid to pick up the phone or send an email to ask for more information. Most agencies do list a contact. Next slide. We talked about the ACS earlier, um, which is a treasure trove of information for pretty much every area in the U.S., but there are often other census data sets and programs that provide data at the state and local level. Some of the best ways to find this data, and also find it in an even better format than the main census site presents it, is to see if your state participates in the Census State Data Center program. Often these state data centers are associated with the local university or state department of planning. I've used the Maryland State Data Center very often for cleaner versions of state and local data. The link at the bottom there is to the network site so that you can travel there and check out the information for your state. Okay, so we're also going to talk about some county and city and state organizations as well. I'm fortunate to work and live in a fairly large and diverse city. There are a lot of nonprofit organizations that are based here that do a lot of work inside and outside the city. I've encountered many of these thanks to the fact that one of the organizations hosts a uh, Baltimore Data Day. To find out what nonprofits are in your area, you can use your Google Foo to look for your city, county, or state name with the words nonprofit and directory. I've included an example of such a directory. This would be the, the Chicago one. Uh, there's the Raleigh one. There's the Idaho one. You get the idea. And these would all be in the .org domain. We move on to the next slide. Something else you might want to check in to see is if your city participates in the National Neighborhood Indicators Partnership. The NNIP is a collaboration between the Urban Institute uh, in Washington, D.C. and local groups in 36 different cities to produce information at the neighborhood level. Um, neighborhood level is not a standard census geography, um, but because a lot of cities are basically made up of neighborhoods, it's beneficial to the local community when it comes to building different programs and making policy. Baltimore is definitely a city of neighborhoods, and the Baltimore Neighborhood Indicators Alliance has provided a wealth of information for people researching crime, health, transportation, housing, and many other issues in the city. And they are the ones who actually put on the Baltimore Data Day to bring us all together, so it was great for making connections. Another thing to consider is if there are hot button issues going on in your area. So often these are areas where you'll find groups that have decided to take on this issue. Is there a water quality problem? Are there lead paint abatement issues? These are the types of things to dig deeper and find out what might lead to more uh, resources. Sorry, told me the direction off there. Okay, we can move on to the next one. So, actually, that was my segue to talking about local colleges and universities. They're famous for taking on hot button issues. Many schools that have sociology, education, urban planning, public health, or public policy programs often have research institutes associated that collect and analyze data on the area in which they are located. For example, one of the research institutes at Johns Hopkins, called the Center for a Livable Future, has been instrumental in mapping out food deserts in our city. They have helped to call attention to a major issue and have worked with the community to provide solutions. One of the products they provide is a web accessible Maryland food system map. Michigan State University's Institute for Public Policy and Social Research, where Haley calls home, puts out data from a survey they conduct quarterly every year on the state of the state. This is a survey that they use to systematically monitor public mood on important issues in major regions in Michigan. My final example is from the University of Pittsburgh, where the Center for Health Equity in their School of Public Health is involved in a community violence prevention project. They put out a report with statistical information on homicides in Pittsburgh in 2013. While you might not get access to raw data, you do have a comprehensive report with all of the sources of the data listed. An easy way to find out if your local college or university has any centers or research institutes around local issues is to search the school's website for centers and or research institutes. So Haley mentioned uh, most of these sources earlier, but I wanted to point out which ones that I found particularly good for certain local data searches. Uh, Sage State and Local Stats will provide you with a neatly packaged way to search for all sorts of stats in multiple areas. If you have a dearth of local resources at your disposal, this could be a way to go, something to look into to subscribe to. Social Explorer provides a very easy way to get to the ACS data in a nice and tidy format uh, for use as a spreadsheet or for people who are working with ArcGIS software. They also offer web mapping for those who don't want to invest in learning ArcGIS. Um, speaking of mapping, there is also Simply Map, which does provide local demographic info like the other two. But where it has been extremely helpful for me is for people when they're doing business-related research. Consumer spending patterns is a very popular reason that people turn to this particular resource. 
ProQuest Statistical Insight was one of the first major compendium stats Haley mentioned, and the splintered off Data Planet statistical data sets continues to provide dynamic access to state and local information. Policy Map provides good information on local housing related issues as well. So while you might not be able to pull raw data from all of these and do analyses, I um, and some of them you can, it just depends on, uh, I guess, what you, what you know, how to pull. Um, I tend to go to these mainly for stats because they're very easy for the novice user to get into. So we can go to the last one here. Um, two data set resources are ICPSR, which Haley mentioned earlier. And you can potentially find data on your area, at least at the state level. They do have a geographic-based search if you want to do that. Uh, for public opinion polls on or about your area, the Roper Center for Public Opinion Search or Opinion Research is a great source. Um, for example, polling data is already available pertaining to recent issues regarding police violence and um, issues of systemic racism. So while there are full data sets there, being able to view timely poll response and distributions you know, very easily and visually is quite useful. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Haley and she'll do a little wrap up for us. All right, thanks, Jen. Uh, so what I'd like to uh, do now is uh, give us a chance to go through a reference question and, and use some of the um, skills we just learned. So the reference question that we're going to go through is uh, listed right here. This is a real question that I received. And the question is, I would like to create a chart showing the following ethnic groups in relation to the total population of Michigan, Arab, Chinese, and Nepali. So you can see the two uh, questions that we're going to ask here. And uh, the first poll question is, who do we think would be a likely producer of this? Uh, this would actually be uh, aggregate statistics. Um, and so let's bring up the poll here. Who is a likely producer um, of the question? Uh, I would like to create a chart showing the following ethnic groups in relation to the total population of Michigan, Arab, Chinese, and Nepali. So ethnic groups in Michigan. Who would be our likely producer? National Neighborhood Indicators Program, the Census Bureau, uh, a department within the Michigan government, the Michigan Department of Technology, Management, and Budget. Um, where they actually have uh, their uh, sort of census uh, connection programs now, although you wouldn't know it from the name, um, and Michigan State of the State Survey, which Jen mentioned uh, earlier. Okay, let's see what, we, what we've got for answers. Yes, indeed, the Census Bureau, as most of you uh, were able to identify, uh, is going to be our producer uh, through their uh, American Community Survey, which Jen was just talking about, collects information about the U.S. population. And let's go to the next question now, uh, which is which, which databases are likely to have this information, if we can bring up that poll. So we're going to bring up a poll. Which databases, which database uh, or databases are likely to have this information? So where might I go if I want uh, information on ethnic groups in Michigan from the Census Bureau? Would I go to American Fact Finder on census.gov? Would I go to Social Explorer? Would I go to Data Planet? or all of the above. So, who's going to have, which database is going to have information about uh, ethnic groups in Michigan? Let's go ahead and close the poll. Yeah, the correct answer is, in fact, all of the above. Um, American Fact Finder uh, from the census is, um, you know, where the, the primary producer is going to publish it. But we were talking about how these other databases are available, which are going to repackage 
um, the statistics from the Census uh, Bureau. Um, if you're at a larger institution um, that has the resources to subscribe to different databases, you can find that the repackaging is uh, can sometimes be quite useful. Of course, you can also just go to the freely available census website too. So I want to talk about my answer um, to this question um, because this question um, actually required quite a bit of digging on my part. Um, so we can get back to the consideration slide. Uh, Andrew's working there. Yeah, sorry, to trying to. Uh, <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> There we go. Okay, so there were um, a number of considerations that I had to take into account in answering this question. Um, it does take some experience to become fluent in census uh, terminology. So uh, in addition to ancestry and race, there's another category I first considered when we were looking at these ethnic groups, which was foreign born. Uh, but that's people who are not US citizens at birth. And this is actually more limiting than ancestry, which is self-identification of ethnic origin or descent. So I decided I wanted to look under uh, ancestry and I actually did find Arab there, but I didn't find uh, Nepali or Chinese. So I had to go into the census topic pages to investigate further. They have a page specifically about ancestry to find out more about that classification. And I found that they don't duplicate groups that are shown elsewhere in the race tables. Um, so I actually had to look at both ancestry and race. Uh, because uh, Chinese and Nepalese are considered subdivisions of the Asian race. Um, and in the course of figuring this all out, I had also searched within FactFinder for Nepali and came up empty-handed. And so only by searching more broadly on the census website, I found reports on the Asian race, which included the proper term of Nepalese. So you know how important it is to have the right keyword. It's exactly the same uh, with uh, statistics as well. And finally, there's a consideration um, about how the ACS, ACS presents uh, their statistics um, or how they allow people to fill out their form. People can choose multiple races, so you actually will see the option when you're looking at tables to see people who chose that single race or ancestry alone or in combination with others. So that's something that you can just uh, tell your patron, hey, you know, you're going to have to make this decision. So um, well, the first part of my answer um, uh, is multiple parts because I had to look in multiple categories, so I couldn't answer this question with a single table. Uh, the first thing I had to do uh, was focus on finding the stats for the uh, Chinese and Nepalese populations, so I limited my race group and I located a table which had groups within the Asian race. Um, so Asian alone or in combination by selected groups. And then by narrowing my geography selection to Michigan, I was able to find this table using the ACS three-year estimates. So next, uh, to find the number of Arabs, I had to switch out race for ancestry. Um, and so in my race and ethnic groups, I had ancestry. And uh, you can see this table is cut off because it's a big, long list of all different uh, ancestry groups. But Arab is right there at the top. Uh, so I was able to find this table on total ancestry reported. And you're going to note that my source for the table remains that same ACS three-year estimate uh, survey. So this is an important thing. You want to make sure when you're combining statistics together um, that you have the exact same source uh, for the best uh, uh, comparison. And part three, so finally I needed to pull a table which would show the total population of individuals in Michigan. Uh, and this one also provides comparison to other main racial and ethnic groups. Um, so uh, just looking at race and ethnicity uh, of individual and geography uh, gets this table. So the student will have to do some work to pull all the number, numbers together and create a chart, but everything they need is there. 
And I wanted to share this question with you because it's a nice example of how a seemingly simple question can actually have multiple moving parts to it and the difficulties that you may encounter. So it's not to discourage you, but to encourage you um, when you are taking maybe longer than you thought you should have to answer a question that that's okay. Um, we run into these same issues of terminology and classification, uh, but it's no different than answering any other type of advanced reference questions. So you already have the skills that you need uh, from your from your regular reference uh from your regular reference activities. So gaining some familiarity with aspects of frequently asked questions such as local area resources and applying those search strategies that we talked through will give you the confidence that you are accurately answering even the toughest data and statistic questions that come your way. So now we have uh, some time for your questions. Okay, thank you very much, Jen and Haley, for your extremely informative presentations. Now we're going to spend some time addressing uh, some of the questions from the audience. Please continue to send them in uh, the question box on the right side of your screen or on Twitter using the hashtag SageTalks. If we can't get to your questions by the end of the hour, our speakers have agreed to address them in a follow-up blog post on the Sage blog, Sage Connection. Um, the first question, to what extent do you try to educate patrons on the distinction between data and statistics when answering a question? Um, I'll go first. This is Haley. Um, I'd say it it depends. <laughs> um, it depends on who I'm talking to, um, you know, what their, uh, the reason they're ans asking the question, if it's for, um, you know, an assignment, um, uh, kind of thinking about well, where is this, this person coming from. Um, if they really do just need a quick answer, then the distinction is for me to make um, and then I'll get them exactly what they need. Um, usually if it's somebody who needs data, you're talking about uh, you know, a, a graduate student or a, a faculty member, um, and they, they sometimes uh, know that that's what they're looking for. Um, if it's uh, you know, an undergraduate student or a member of the public, um, and their answer um, can't be answered by statistics, then maybe I'd get into them, get into a discussion of, you know, well, what data is, and, you know, is that something that they could handle? What do you think, Jen? Okay, well, this is Jen. I think the only thing that I would add to what Haley already said is, I like to figure out, so what are you going to do with this information? What, well, how do you, how, what are you going to do? do you, are you just wanting something that you can you know, put in a paper? Are you looking for something to analyze? Um, because even faculty sometimes will come to me and say, you know, I want this kind of thing from this many countries over this amount of time, and it could be this unwieldy amount of information that, yeah, if you turn to raw data, you could pull that. But on occasion, they'll say, well, I really just was hoping somebody had already done this and that it was in a nice table that I could use. So often I'll try to get that leading question of, so what do you want to do with this? You know, what do you hope to, to use it for? That kind of, and then when they talk to me about it, that's when I can say, okay, yes, you're looking for um, statistics on this then, so you don't really want to dig into the data. So I guess I don't belabor the point, but it, you know, I at least try to get them to kind of understand the difference. And usually they're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Okay, uh, the next question was about uh, having the slides sent out, and the webinar recording and slides will be sent to all registrants in the coming weeks. So next question, how do you account for potential bias in stat producers, especially from private sources? Uh, okay, I'll, I'll, well, I'll take go it. first this time. Okay, please. go ahead, John. <laughs> okay, we did it at the same time. Um, I guess kind of like how you you know investigate bias in reports and things like that. I treat it the same way with data. So when I you know working with a student, if the source appears to be you know one of those like for example you know I love animals but let's just say PETA can be a bit extreme. I might you know 
want to look into some of their sources a bit more deeply as to what data they're pulling from, just because they they tend to be on the extreme end of things. And and you have to watch with the commercial sources. If they don't have their methods available, you know, that clearly outline how they collected the data, I would always I would consider that dubious regardless of whoever it came from. So trying to look for especially educating students, you know, watching for bias, you know, making sure that the data that you're accessing is not from some of a particular political bent or, you know, or a particular cause that they're pushing really hard for. You want to try to find something as non-biased as possible. That's basically how I approach it. But, you know, for those sources that are required that need to come from businesses, I want to see the methods. I want to know how the data was collected. That stuff should be pretty transparent. So, Haley, what do you have to say about that? Um, I think that's a really great uh, summary, Jen. Uh, it is just like any other piece of information that uh, that you're looking at. You want to take into uh, account, um, you know, who the producer is and what their motivations are uh, for putting out uh, the information, um, and the way that you you do that with uh, data and statistics is not just by looking at the producer, but by looking at the transparency of their methodology. Um, and seeing if if you can uh, interrogate that. Okay, next question. Can you recommend Canadian equivalents or international resources? Um, Canada has, I believe they have a, a Statistics Canada. Um, and I know there's uh, a whole a group of uh, data librarians in Canada under the banner of the Data Liberation Initiative um, that uh, are going to know far more than I do. Um, for international, um, a lot of uh, NGOs um, like United Nations um, will compile um, from statistical agencies uh, around the world, so those uh, sources that are compiling together are, are very useful, and then you can go out to the individual um, uh, countries as needed. What do you think, Jen? Sure. Uh, actually, I when we were talking about city, county, and state government, the one particular slide that I had, there's actually 45 international countries that have open data portals and 163 international regions. So for Canada, they have open.canada.ca and that is their open data portal. So just, um, I know that our government site actually tries to link to all of these. So you can um, potentially use that link that I had in my slide to, to get to some of those. But yeah, specifically for Canada, open.canada.ca would be a great place to uh, start. Okay, I think we have time for one quick question. I'm interested in the line between teaching these skills to patrons and doing the finding and interpreting for patrons, especially in academic libraries. Any comments? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I'll use a, an example that um, I've heard used um, before, which is, you know, in, I guess sort of in traditional librarianship, we lead, we lead the people to the book. If they want a book written in Swahili, we give it to them, but we don't, you know, interpret, you know, we don't translate Swahili for them uh, or read the book to them. Um, but uh, some academic libraries are, you know, sort of uh, looking at uh, changing uh, the uh, offerings that they provide, or there might be another uh, institution on larger campuses, another center on larger campuses that uh, have a stake in uh, interpreting or helping with uh, interpretation or analysis of data. Um, at MSU, we have. Um, the Center for Statistical uh, Training and Consulting that does that sort of thing. Uh, so it kind of depends on, on your institution, um, the resources and range of services uh, that you offer, and what you feel comfortable doing yourself. Okay, well, that's about I all. I would echo what Haley said. Oh. 
No, I was just going to say I would echo what, what Haley said and basically that whole thing of, you know, I, I will give them the components to succeed. You know, if they don't know how to deal with a particular data set, I'll show them. You need to look at the user manual. You need to look at the code book. You need to have statistical code for this to read in. I might help troubleshoot reading the file in for a format, so something that's more the technical pain in the, you know, behind kind of thing. But when it comes to them doing their analysis, that's their job. That's not my job. So just like you wouldn't, you know, synthesize their literature search results into a paper, you're not going to analyze their data. So I guess that's how I look at it as well. Okay. Well, um, that's all the time we have. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And a special thank you to Jen and Haley. In the coming weeks, please be on the lookout for an email that includes a link to view the entire webinar and slides, as well as answers to some of the questions we didn't have time to get to today. Please stay connected with us on our blog, Sage Connection, for information about upcoming webinars. Have a good day.